buddies. Recording in progress. And I know that this is official now since we heard that sound. So greetings, everybody. And uh, let's kick this off. Um, we have our city clerk call the roll. Council Member Albert. Here. Council Member Hoffa. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Council Member Williamson. And Mayor Roberson. And the mayor will join us as soon as we can. All right. Okay, great. Um, Clementine, if we could um, move to the Pledge of Allegiance, if you could provide the flag on the screen, that'd be great. Absolutely. Hold on one moment. Uh, Dan, if there's some technical problems, leave us in the play, please. I have to unmute myself. Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so the first item and the only item tonight is a study session is a uh, staff uh, presentation, receive a presentation on mutually modern uh, United Governance model. Um, so let, let's uh, dive right into it. And uh, tonight there won't be any agenda items where we're taking a vote, but this is for information purposes tonight to learn from staff as we prepared to go into districts uh, to represent our fine city and uh, make sure that we recognize the entire community. So Hans, let me turn it over to you for the first item. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Smith, uh, Council Member Albert, Council Member Hoffa. Um, I've thought long and hard about my introduction to this topic. And uh, if you have um, seen me in action over the past years in front of city council from time to time, I always quote a favorite book of mine, uh, which has a lot of wisdom for management uh, in there, especially for city managers. Uh, that book is um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland uh, by Lewis Carroll. And um, I thought I'd start with a reading out of that for you. And uh, that will hopefully perfectly set up this discussion about uh, mutual Monterey and what we try to accomplish today. So here we go. It's uh, in chapter two of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Down the rabbit hole. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out of, to get out again. The rabbit hole went straight on like a tunnel for some way and then dipped suddenly down so suddenly that Alice had not a moment to think about stopping herself before she found herself falling down what seemed to be a very deep well. Either the well was very deep or she fell very slowly for she had plenty of time as she went down to look about her and to wonder what was going to happen next. So that is, I think, a good introduction to the topic to tonight. It's, uh, and for those viewers who just uh, uh, are tuning in. This is not the library board meeting. Uh, this is still a council study session. Uh, but but it's 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 basically the, the, a good introduction to the topic. We are switching in November for the first time to uh, bring on board district-based elected council members. And there is some sort of a rabbit hole here that we really don't know exactly uh, how will this affect our day-to-day -day governance. And so our, our council meeting to today, our study session today, uh, and I see council member uh, Williamson is joining us right now. Uh, our council session today will address some of those challenges that were brought up also in front of our council when we discussed uh, at length during five scheduled meetings, 
uh, the transition from at large elections to district based elections that people were just asking questions and and uh, were concerned raised concerns about are we still looking out for Monterey or are we just uh, getting divided up in, in district uh, based thoughts and district based intentions uh, shall the budget then be divided up in districts uh, if somebody gets their potholes uh, fixed in new Monterey uh, will another district claim that we are neglecting them? So a lot of those questions uh, are were addressed during this process. And around that time when we were looking at that, um, Annette came to me and said, well, you know, uh, other cities who have transitioned to, to district-based elections, um, what, what the general tenor there is, uh, get your current council together, the at-large council together, and see what they think about this and how they address those those topics, and um, uh, stick your head together with them. And then, uh, once we are switching to district-based election, this may or may not be as some sort of iterative process, but lay the foundation now how you will, uh, how we will, you the council, how we will the staff and the council then. Uh, work together towards uh, uh, our overall uh, well-being as a city of Monterey. And so to today, uh, we, we, we put together um, a presentation and a few background uh, elements that are already contained in the agenda report to just have that conversation with you, uh, listen to you, Council, and see uh, how, how we are falling down that rabbit hole while looking around and then seeing where we will hopefully land. So with that, I'll uh, ask Nat to, to take it, take over and uh, introduce the topic. Great. Thank you so much, Hans. And uh, we plan to go through uh, two different parts uh, for today's presentation, an overview of what Mutually Monterey, the unified governance model is, why we're having this conversation with you today, and then go through a little bit of a dialogue to gather feedback from all of you uh, as we uh, go on this journey together. And um, we'll first kick it off by talking about uh, the purpose of today's study session is to have a dialogue to determine how effective governance principles and practices can be maintained under this new district-based election system that we'll be transitioning to uh, starting this November. And one of the common questions we've been asked over the last uh, few days, especially since this agenda packet uh, was published, is why now when we have not yet held district-based elections? And Hans mentioned that. It's because one of the best practices is for city councils to discuss these approaches in the early stages of district-based elections. We've seen that um, our community members have been talking about uh, districts, what does this mean and having those conversations earlier on can uh, can help us through the process and council can choose to enter into further discussion as well uh, according to the league of california cities during these transitions it's very common for formerly at large council members to not radically shift their behavior and mindset to look at interests of the cities as a whole but there is a concern that large culture shifts in governance occurs when new council members are elected who have never won an at-large seat. I was just speaking to a colleague of mine, city manager from a Bay Area city earlier today about how uh, one out of their five council members has never won an at-large seat. And that person's mentality is very much focused uh, and uh, narrow-minded on, on only their district's uh, views. And that does become a challenge when we look at trying to solve the city's problems as a whole. So that's why we're having that discussion today. So we have three goals for you this afternoon. The first is to review the city's decision to move to district-based elections. We'll try to cover that as briefly as possible. We'll talk a little bit about best practices among cities and have a discussion with council, and then in introduce a proposed concept for you, which is mutually Monterey, a unified governance framework. So let's talk briefly about the transition to district-based elections. Um, as many of you know, last fall, we received a letter from LULAC and in the spring of 2022, the council adopted an ordinance and finalized a map for us to, uh, for the city of Monterey to move to district-based elections. Uh, this is a phased approach. So starting in uh, 2022, districts one and two council member seats will be up for election. 
The other two seats would remain at large. And then districts three and four council member seats would be elected by district for districts three and four. And this is a graphic of the what was called at the time the dolphin map that was adopted by the city council. And I think most of you are, are familiar with this and community members should be as well. And as a recap, the purpose of having district based elections was to ensure that the ability of minority groups to elect representatives of their choice is not impaired as a result of vote dilution. That's one of the reasons why District 4 has one of the, the most uh, diverse uh, demographics in, in all of the districts. Also, it's intended to be for election purposes. That's one of the conversations that we had and that the council, all of you had with the community was the concern that if we go to district-based elections, will the city's interests as a whole be considered uh, in the future? Or are we going to be myopically focused on, on the specific districts one, two, three, and four? It was reiterated from council that we wanted to have, uh, make sure that this wouldn't change how we viewed the community and how we made decisions and that community division doesn't occur as a result of district-based thinking. So let's talk briefly about the best practices among cities transitioning to district-based elections. There are four elements of effective city councils according to the California Nonprofit Institute for Local Government. This is an organization that is represented and is uh, parent organizations include the League of California Cities and the California State Association of Counties. And the four elements include, first of all, having a unity of purpose. The second is a positive governance culture. Third, clear roles and responsibilities. And fourth is norms, protocols, and policies. I, I think uh, City Manager Hans Uslar and myself, we and our exec team, we would argue that our council has all four of these. Uh, it's, the question is, how do we continue to have this as we transition to district-based elections? And as we work towards that unified vision, reviewing what those existing and potential governance norms look like, what the potential policy impacts look like, and then what does this unified governance framework look like? And when we say unified, it goes back to this mutually Monterey concept. So what we'd like to do for this segment of the program is turn it back over to council. We have a few questions that we've posed, and these are questions that ILG, when they've had uh, facilitated uh, efforts with city councils that have made this transition to district-based elections, they've asked. So, uh, and, and we've modified some of these questions as well. But what I'd like to do is quickly transition over to a virtual easel pad, if you will, and we're going to ask uh, you some questions and get feedback from, uh, from council. So let me share the correct screen and we'll go over to the, uh, the Word document. And hopefully you all see the screen. Does everyone see this? Yep, awesome. So first question, big picture question is, is election by district the same as governing by district? And how do we maximize the opportunities of having district-based elections, but also minimize the risks? And it's a free for all, so anyone can go first. Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Hoffa, hello. Thanks, Ed. Um, so the reality is people are going to be elected by citizens in their district. And those citizens are going to expect those district elected council members to represent their interests. And, and that's not an unreasonable expectation, right? Um, you know, somebody who represented the city of Monterey on the MPUSD school board, which is district did, um, my approach was to balance my responsibility and duty to represent, you know, Monterey and that particular district, as well as to look at the whole district. Um, I think it's something where it helps if um, if there are if there's a shared vision and goals. I think that can help to kind of always refocus um, the body back upon our shared vision and goals. I think it's going to be incumbent upon 
the council as we add new members that are elected by district to have retreats where we revisit our you know mission vision and, and goals our drivers because it really has to be you know a shared vision i think this council's done that and by, by and large, I think we um, share a common vision and I think that's why we've worked together pretty well. Um, I think it's going to take special leadership from the mayor, whoever they are, because they are the one person who will be elected at large. And um, in, again, in my experience on the MPUSD board, the leadership of the chair made a difference in terms of things like making sure that everybody was heard, making sure that, um, oh boy, what's the word, that the culture of the board or the council in this case is um, one of mutual respect, even where people may disagree. Um, yeah, so those are just a few of my initial thoughts. I think it we can't expect there not to be some push for these for representatives to strongly advocate for perhaps the unique needs of their district. And then it just becomes a matter of people sort of negotiating and and looking at our shared vision and um, and trying to make the best decision that that council in the future can make. OK, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Hoffa. Very helpful and the perspective from uh, serving on the MPUSD board uh, definitely uh, has parallels with our transition. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right. The special leadership from the mayor, and I, I would also argue uh, the city, you know, city managers, uh, city manager as well, uh, and the executive team um, as we work through challenges with the constituents' uh, needs. Um, who, who also has uh, some things I'd like to share on the specific big picture question? Um, and that, if, help, if you'll help me pick up anyone that's, uh, you know, raising their hand, seeing the council members right now. Um, Dan, did you have some thoughts? Uh, Dan, we can't hear you. I said not yet. I, I do want to say, um, uh, I did sit on, or I didn't sit on, but I was a part of uh, MQSD when Alan was uh, a board member. And um, I know that uh, it was a very difficult time uh, during that uh, particular uh, time in our district. And uh, I, I wanna say that uh, what Alan just, uh, just mentioned was exactly what we, we did to bring that uh, that district together. And, and a lot of that had to do with Alan, um, Alan's leadership. I just have to say that. So uh, I think what Alan said is perfectly said. Um, so I, I, I can't add to that, Alan, because I know that that's the experience you had in MPSD. And um, so uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's well said. Um, yeah, if, if I can add some thoughts to the picture, I was trying to visualize what this looked like um, if, when we were to put operations together or if I was communicating with a constituent from one particular area of the community, but especially, you know, now it would be District 2 if I were to prevail in the next election. So um, I look at this as kind of an overlay. And if you look at, you know, um, you know, 1,000 foot and 5,000 foot and, and 10,000 foot and 30,000 foot. But I think that the concentration would always naturally be to uh, your neighbors, uh, your close proximity in your district. Um, this piece that we talked about when we were going through the district processing was the community of interest. So it's the district that um, has association activity through neighborhoods parks, churches, uh, your neighbors, businesses that you may shop at, uh, ball fields, uh, schools. So it's that closer, it's that thousand foot level. And then if you go out, we certainly have to have a responsibility to the neighboring districts. So it's not just the, the only district that counts or that's important is my district, that's not true. It's 
what's to the east, what's to the west, what's north, what's the south, geographic, whoever I'm close to, because all of us are navigating on the same streets to get through to a district. It's not like our districts in some communities, they're miles apart or they're, they're distinctly larger and they're distinctly further apart. Our districts really aren't. Our districts are right next to each other and we're all sharing the same kinds of things that I would call as the community of interest. Um, so I think it's thinking of it like a, a planning overlay, if you will. You have plots and sites and, and you have specific information, but then you, you go further out and it gets bigger and you go further out and it gets bigger and it's the whole city. Um, we're all going to be looking at a budget that applies to all of the districts. Uh, we're all going to be looking to leverage and navigate through our city manager and staff with citywide services. And it certainly it can't be portioned out. It can't be divided out. We have to have the mindset that this is a budget for the entire city. And certainly a city like ours that has a large budget with a lot of services, I just don't think anybody's going to get left out. I think that there's going to be a concentrated effort on public works, transportation, on roadway systems, on parks, um, sports center, uh, the, the central areas that we all participate in. I think we're going to go across all the districts. Um, so looking at it like from an operational question, which is the next question, what is required, I would say. I hope not much changes in terms of conduct and behavior at the council when we're representing our district at the same time representing the larger community. Um, so I want to jump to add a, a bullet point to what's required, um, what's required in, to change under a district election. I think that the mechanical piece has changed. That's the process by which everyone gets elected, except for the at-large mayor. So I hope we don't have any other changes, frankly. But from an operational side, I think we'll probably hear a lot as we move forward from the city manager and staff is how the communications changes, how we're all informed. The information is not just given to the district, but is given to all city council members that we don't leave a councilman or council person out of the process just because maybe it's district three, but you're in district one, and then all of a sudden we have silos. So I think operationally we'll make sure that we guard against creating a silo and we don't exclude any particular district council person just because some things happened in another district. I think the communications needs to go across all, all the, uh, the the forms to make sure everybody is, is informed. So there aren't any blind spots in the communications, the knowledge, the consideration of that district that may be just one street away from my district, but I still wanna know what's happening in the other district because it's still part of the community. So I hope there's not a lot of changes, but operationally, I think that there will be some nuances of how staff will handle that. Ed, if I can add on to that, uh, Tyler, I can't see if you're raising your hand. So if you don't mind, I can just, if you don't mind, I'd just like a comment on a couple of things that Ed said, or, or do you have something to start off with? And I can go back to Ed. I have some thoughts, go ahead. So Ed, you make a good point about uh, overlaying on uh, neighborhoods because some of our districts do overlay, uh, meaning that uh, a council member will represent two, two neighborhoods. I mean, that, that does happen. So uh, obviously those two council members are gonna have to work together because they, they're in the same neighborhoods. So uh, the, the one thing I wanted to mention, uh, I thought it was very interesting, was about identifying citywide um, goals that Alan talked about, but that could also be projects or any type of project that we can identify these, like for instance, the 
even though the sports center may sit in one district, we all as a council have to agree that that sports center is really much like the NCIP, is yeah. like a city project, not just that council member's uh, sports center. And, and there are probably multiple places on the city that you can identify that, especially parks, because parks are used throughout the city, throughout uh, our, our residents, or city halls, another one. So even though those, those citywide um, areas of, um, or projects of the, of the city sit in each one of our districts, um, they are still recognized as the, the city as a whole. Um, then the second thing is, um, if I can remember what I was gonna say, um, well, I forgot, yeah, well. Tyler, go ahead. I know there was one other. I'm just seeing interrupt you, Tyler, if I remember. Yeah, That's no. Your moment. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. Yeah, please, please do because I don't want you to lose your thought. I want, I want it to be. No, to go know. ahead. Go ahead, Tyler. Um, you know, my, my thought, and and I think all all of my colleagues here have, have hit on it is just a need for folks to come in, and and I think it will naturally happen. Um, but somehow I, I think you know also folding it into our our culture when we're onboarding. Um, new electeds um, to somehow communicate with them the need of the entire community and, and, and making sure that's baked in, right? So it'd be wonderful if we were able to, um, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like with the council between now and the election, but, you know, maybe it's just um, making sure that they have access to our value drivers, mission, vision, um, and that's given to them as part of a welcome packet um, up, upon entering office and, and coming into the city um, and, and making that just part of the culture so that we, 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 we ensure that folks from the get-go are established in a way that, that makes them think of the city overall, as opposed to maybe what occurred during the, uh, the election process and, and having to listen to their um, constituents within their district. So I think that's just kind of the, the little piece of additional feedback that I'll provide at this point. And, and, I, I, I do remember what I was going to say. So thanks, Tyler. So I, I think that at this point, we have to remember why we went into districting. And it's not to represent each one of the different districts, but it's so that we can have people on council that are inclusive to their areas. So it's not necessarily, uh, you know, you're representing this district and that's why you're on the council. You're still looking at the, dis as the city as a, uh, one big uh, a unit, but however, you're here on the council to represent um, at least that section of the city, not necessarily advocating for the city, but we just needed more people from around the city instead of just uh, one area. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I think, I think the overall spirit of us moving to districts is to make sure that uh, border to border, Anybody that wants to go through the process and the work to get elected um, certainly is not left out. And so I think the district process, if it's done anything, probably has gotten some folks um, aware, alive, they paid attention, and maybe they'll express some interest in, in getting involved. Then it's not just at the council level, it's Parks and Rec, it's ARC, it's Planning Commission. There's a tremendous initiative that comes from uh, a community like Monterey that's actually not just run by this council. Certainly we make the votes. We have a, a wonderful staff. It's the city manager is um, supervising all of the moving parts, but we couldn't do this without all of those other members that, that step up and choose to serve on boards and commissions. Um, so I, I hope that that doesn't change. I hope that we still have a heavy level of engagement um, I, I want to go back to something, since this is a session where we have an opportunity to link and connect when someone says something, it first a comment, and, and then it reminds us of a thought. I want to use the, the model of the NCIP process. Um, so I was, I was reflecting on uh, the district that, that I live in and was thinking in terms of, well, how many districts do I have? How many churches do I have? And I mentioned this at the last council meeting. But um, to, to represent all of those neighborhood improvement um, areas, it still requires a lot of work on a council member. 
So it doesn't just stop at the border of where my district will be. Um, because if you think of a, a neighborhood association that I have a portion of it, let's say I have 30% of it, but the other 70% is in a different district. So that requires me to have an obligation to be engaged in both districts and their board and the other city council member, as Dan has mentioned. So you really can't just parse this down to small segments. Um, it's easier to work smaller portions, but I think the thing I hope that still stays the same is that it is a community-wide thought process with maybe a little effort to make connections to the other associations in the other districts. Uh, but I think the model that we have is the way the neighborhood association comes together to consider their voting carefully and navigate through the issues of um, competing interests and limited resources. Uh, but we shouldn't look at this as a, uh, I don't know, parochial, uh, like this is the line and this is where it stops. I just think we have some great models with the neighborhood um, improvement program and the way that they operate. And I think that's going to drive the way a district council person is going to have to function because we're all going to have in our districts multiple neighborhood associations, multiple business associations. Um, we all come together using uh, churches and parks and, and the same roads. So I just hope that it's like has been said, the onboarding helps future council members. And we demonstrate that and we mentor that by the conduct that happens with each and every council as it moves forward every two years. Ed, I, can I, I add two additional uh, points here? Yeah, go for it, Ted. Uh, so, so one is I think getting to this idea of the, of the NCIP and what that means. And obviously right now, there are some neighborhood associations that bleed into um, multiple districts. And, and I, one of the pieces of feedback that I heard from um, individuals involved with the NCIP is just questioning what the future of that looks like. And so I am not necessarily advocating for a specific person, but I, I would just say that it's important for the council now and in the future after the election to stay open and in dialogue with the community around what that looks like. So I, I think it's I think the point that I'm trying to make is that it's okay for things to change and for things to shift around a little bit. I think one of the things that I've heard as a potential idea was do we reestablish the neighborhood associations in a way that align with districts? And again, I'm not advocating for that. I'm just I'm just identifying the need for the council and the leadership within the city to stay flexible and mobile and, and open in communication with the public around what the future of, of this experience looks like together. Um, and, then, and then the other point that I would make, and it's on the inclusive inclusivicity um, idea. Um, and one of the things, again, that I think we heard a lot through the process of going to districts was just making sure that we're listening to the majority of our residents and not just necessarily homeowners, as an example, um, that are, our uh, population that tends to have normally normally high historical turnout, um, and so I think that that's a, a net positive for for the community to have that increased diversity of thought perspective um, from different points of view. Um, and I, I'm I'm excited to see what that looks like and, and work on that experience of better representation within the city of Monterey. Uh, so Tyler, if I can come back and ask, um, and I know you, you you're thinking is to add to this, but the associations are not formed by the city. So I think it's the association, an association among the neighbors that they, they, they decide what they want to do with their board. Um, and they've determined um, a lot of the, the direction they have. We do approve of the boundaries, certainly. Um, but I think it's, um, I don't, just don't know that I feel comfortable in taking that sort of thing on because of the nature of and the uniqueness of each of the association neighborhoods. Um, so I just, yeah. if, if I could just clarify, I, I wasn't identifying the need for the city to take that on. I was just identifying the need for us to stay flexible and work with the neighborhood associations and what that looks like in the future. 
I'm so, wondering if we can, we have quite a few more questions to, to, to go through the process and we can go into you know, some of the details, but um, I know Al Council Member Hoffa had a hand raised and perhaps we can go on to some of the other questions if everyone's okay with that. Um, yeah, but uh, Nat, I wanna close that in the talk. Thank you, Tyler. I just think that the addition should be somewhere that we take the input of the neighborhood associations, just like we would take uh, the high engagement from boards and commissions. And I think that's what you're saying, Tyler. Exactly. Um, Alan. Has uh, Alan? Sound? Can you hear me? No, nope, we can hear okay. you. Sorry, I had the other thing on. So, um, you know, this is, I think, related to what may need to change. I think it's worth a conversation of should it change? And that's, um, you know, the boards and commissions and their makeup. Council's gone back and forth over the years with different methods of how we appoint people to boards and commissions. And, um, and I'm wondering if this isn't a good time to talk about that and whether it should shift. One thing that occurs to me is the NCIP is unique in that although it isn't based on representation by district, it's based on representation by neighborhoods. But to that extent, it guarantees the kind of geographical diversity anyway across the city. Other boards and commissions, I don't know we've ever really looked at in that way. And um, I, for one, I guess I'd be interested to see based on our districts as they're now drawn, how many people on the various boards and commissions come from various districts. It could be that we have good diverse representation. It could be that we don't. It also occurred, to, and if we don't, you know, that might be something we wanna look at. How do we, how do we address that? Um, it could be that each district uh, council member could appoint one person perhaps from their district. I don't know. Um, in any case, I think that's something that we, we may want to look at. Great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Berhoffa. We've written that down. Very good uh, list here of uh, some big picture questions and uh, talking about both the opportunities and the risks and what this looks like. So uh, very helpful. I think when we talk about what's required, and, and it really is only uh, from, a, I think, a legal perspective, uh, Karen can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but it's only by the process in which individuals are uh, elected and that's by district. Uh, nothing else really is required um, as a result of district-based elections. Let's ask the question and maybe go through this piece. What can be done to assure that decisions are made on what's best for the city as a whole and what might help maintain a citywide perspective? Um, let me just dive into because I think that top list that, uh, is pretty uh, inclusive, and, and I think there's answers that are in that top question. I think the theme is uh, the willingness here as a member, um, the onboarding that's been mentioned, that the new councilors um, are given appropriate time with uh, the mayor, other council members uh, early early uh, team building exercise with new council members, um, allocating sufficient time with key members of the city staff, certainly the city manager, and, and making sure that maybe there's um, a little bit more time with electives as they're going in the process. Uh, and I know that's hard because, you know, there's only so much you can do if we have, you know, let's say we have 15 candidates, certainly that would be unwieldy difficult but I think if we carve out the dedication that's that says we want to make sure we don't let any new council members um, not have adequate time for the onboarding piece and I, just like any other organization would certainly uh, so I think the, the appropriate amount of time with staff to make sure that they they see how we operate and hopefully uh, potential um, council members that are, are you know, going through an election are going to come to the city council and watch how it operates and, and reach out and communicate with a lot of folks to, to learn how the, the culture works, the process, uh, and certainly the business side of being on the city council. 
Great, thank you, Vice Mayor Smith. Any uh, other thoughts on this question, or we can we can also uh, move on to other questions if you like as well. Yeah, let's move to the next one. Okay, this one. What so what happens if this is uh, ensuring a fair and inclusive process? If a constituent from someone else's district reaches out to you, what would be the best way to address specific concerns of a district's constituents? And how and when should items be raised to the entire council to ensure awareness of issues that may have citywide impacts? And again, no right or wrong answer here. I see Councilmember Hoffa's hand is raised first. Yeah, go for it, Alan. So I just want to say this is kind of a tricky one because um, you know, on the one hand, uh, a resident should have the right to reach out to any any council member or mayor, you know, and um, and certainly there are issues that really are citywide, you know. In which case, obviously, they may want to reach out to all of us, and all of us vote. So, from that perspective, they may, you know, there may be a benefit to them in trying to communicate with as many of us as possible. On the other hand, and this is where I think it's something that maybe each council needs to talk about how they want to deal with this, because what if um, somebody from Ed's new district, and Ed, I forget, is that district three? Two. Two. Were to contact me, and I were to sort of get all gung-ho about something, <laughs> and then turns out that the council member who was elected in that district, in this case, Ed, maybe has different points of view, or maybe knows something I don't know, in other words, it could be a way, it could end up creating tension and uh, bad feelings. So I, I, I honestly, I don't have a great answer to this other than I think people need to talk about it. If I get an email from somebody in district two, one thing we could do is say, you know what, um, resident, you know, Mr. or Miss, um, whatever your last name is, um, council member Ed, represents your district. Here's how to get a hold of him. Here's the mayor who represents the whole city. Please contact them first. That might be something I don't know. I don't know if that's the best way. Interested in hearing what you all think, but, but I do think there is a tension there that we have to be aware of. Yeah. Uh, Alan, or uh, Dan, I see your hand. Uh, Dan, you're, you're muted. You would think after two and a half years, I'd know how to do that. But anyway, um, I agree. Uh, I think that it's going to happen because even though everybody in Monterey agrees with Ed, I, I understand that. Just joking, Ed. But there's going to be somebody that's going to disagree in your, your district. And what's going to happen is you tell them, well, here's my answer. And they're going to go, no, I don't like that answer. So I'm going to move to somebody else and see if I can get a better answer. And that will happen. Maybe what has to happen in uh, in our in our council, and that's I think the the role of the mayor because he's at large or she's at large, whoever's at large, that that council member in the other district says, you know, I really think you should go talk to the mayor first and discuss it with him, and then the mayor yeah, can go, then the mayor can go to that that council member in the district and talk to him about. Uh, the issue or whatever it is. And then uh, I think that would be a, a better way to, um, to, to alleviate that because I think once you get two council members involved in one district, as Alan says, that could cause a lot of friction, not just a little bit, but a lot. Um, because I've seen that in uh, schools where one employee will go to one school district um, board member talking about a school district, a school in his district or her district. And that causes a lot of tension within that one school. So uh, that's what the superintendent's for. So what you would do is go talk to the superintendent and said, and the superintendent would try and work it out. So that's why I think the role of the mayor at large, that's one of the reasons why I think the mayor should be at large is because to, to, to uh, work with, with the different problems like the one that's right here on the on the screen. Yeah, Dan, um, and I would add to that that the equalizer in this is 
obviously it starts with respect, mutual respect and mutual uh, the positions that a district, one district and the other district uh, would have. A working relationship doesn't mean you have to agree or the same philosophy, but uh, when you talk about, uh, and I'll use the, the concierge service for the community. In other words, um, you don't just blow somebody off, but you take it serious. You take an email, you take a phone call, and you try and drive it to the point where you get a solution, and it gets the initiative. It may it may have to go to staff. So I think the equalizer here is the mayor and the city manager, and I think it may impose on a little more work on the district council member um, to listen and carefully know what they're talking about. They know their district. They know their boundaries. They know which side of the street that person may live in because it may be a finite kind of thing where one side of the street's district three and the other side of the street is district two. So, but it doesn't mean that we exclude that person's point of view. And issue. I think it means that the district that receives it, it has a responsibility to drive it to the point of nearest completion or action, and that may be the mayor and it may be the city manager, and it certainly would include the district from, from where the concern is. But I think it, it starts with mutual respect and, and a, little more, a little bit more work on the council members' back. So I think also, Ed, um, just to, to add on to that, um, you may not have a mayor, you may have a mayor that doesn't want to be the referee, and, and that's what that that is that's a problem. So then you have to be disciplined as a council outside of that district to go in and look at it in a balanced approach and and talk to the other council member with respect and say this is what I'm hearing. Uh, I just want to let you know that. And then those two council members will, will work it out together uh, with with the person that um, disagrees with the council member that's originally in the district. Yeah, and certainly over overriding this inclusive process, at the end of the result, we are all responsible to those that elect us. So if, if we wind up not serving very well, and not being very responsive, and not answering emails, or phone calls, and don't show up to meetings, we, we know the consequences. Uh, you're going to get handled, and you're probably not going to get reelected. So a council member can't just blow this off. They have to be engaged. On Serious problem. This is this is a real real good questions. I like these questions. I, I could add in a, a thought here too. But, and, and of course, it's it's. I think every, what everybody is saying is is spot on in regard, particularly in regards to issues that might be specific to the district. Um, and just get us to think about it too from another perspective, in which is, you know, there might be a constituent that's addressing a a, a council member from a, from another district. That might be focused on a citywide issue that is um, that 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 is of interest to them, and so I just wonder what that looks like in regards to, you know, create it, it, not being in that category of what we were talking about in regards to creating conflict. Um, just speaking out loud in, in in regards to kind of how do we just describe that difference between kind of district-based issues versus um, kind of more, more citywide focused issues, kind of more broader uh, reach issues. Yeah, th that was my point, Tyler, when I said that I think the first thing the council needs to do is identify those citywide, um, the citywide ideas or whatever, priorities. And that way everyone knows that those are up for grab, so to speak. Well, and uh, we did get a copy of that probably uh, not the last team building, but the time before that, where there was a master list of um, city projects, some long term, some short term. So that that's probably worth uh, making sure it's it's, all, it's at the ready and is really up. I, I think that was uh, well over a hundred items that was on it. I don't remember what staff called that list, but it's the, the work work plan. Essentially, it's all those things that are percolating that are in some sort of process. I think that'll be really helpful for any new member to know. 
So just one last thing on that, Tyler. Um, I, I think I know what direction you're going. So let's say for instance, there's, there's one council member that is a, a, a real housing advocate. I won't say who it is, but a real housing advocate. And then in another district, there is a project going on that maybe that council member doesn't or, or, or doesn't think it should go there. Sounds familiar. But um, can that one council member that is an advocate of housing uh, step into that person's district and advocate for that project that the council member doesn't agree with? Is that what kind of where we're going there, Tyler? Well, I guess, and this is kind of where there's gray area, right? Because yeah. At the end of the day, and we were discussing this earlier, um, you know, they're going to have to be able to count the votes and be able to get the support for for whatever. But how much in that example that you gave is it appropriate for the elected that's being appro being approached from a different district? How much is it appropriate for them to say, "Hey, have you checked in with your uh, your district representative? Have you checked in with the mayor?" Um, you know, that might be an appropriate, at least based response, not to say that they can't engage in the dialogue with them around right. what it looks like, because at the end of the day, they're one of the five votes that are going to help make or break the issue that might be important to them. Yeah, that, that takes discipline. That's tough sometimes to do that. Uh, Hans, I see what Hans is, is the, uh, the key person in all this. Your thoughts? Yeah, th th thank you so much, um, uh, Vice Mayor Smith. The first and foremost, I think um, when a district council member needs two other buddies on the council to help him or her to be successful. So I, I need to share with you this kind of district thinking that, that you are expressing right now gives me time to worry. Because um, if, if a council member see if if a, if a constituent sees some sees some sees something uh, of concern for him or her, and um, that person feels um, the most comfortable to talk to a council member in a different district, so be it. Uh, it it, uh, it I think you don't want to punt it back and say, oh no, you go to the other person because. Uh, District-based elections are not based on the districts. They are based on, on giving uh, communities of interest a chance to have representation on the, on the uh, council. And I think council member um, Alan Hoffer uh, pointed it out so, 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 so uh, appropriately when he said, but the reality is, and, and he, he said it that way, uh, with respect when you said the reality is they are still part of the district. And so it, I think it's important for you, the council, to balance that. Um, I cannot look away when, when somebody comes to me and says something about a topic and I'm like, yeah, that's not our deal. Go, go, go to Caltrans, you know. Uh, I cannot look away when, 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 we get issue, when we get an issue about something else and just say, not in my job description, it's not the city. We, we need to help. And I think the same is for the districts. So I just want to urge the council or caution the council to not really um, look, at, look at that with respect, like a chain of command or something. You need to work together. And, uh, and it's a team sport, uh, as, as I always share with the council members. Uh, also running the operations of the city, which is my job, is for me a team sport. I, I am listening to every single one of you, and, and that's the same. So I just want to be um, issuing that kind of um, input at, at this time because, uh, um, like I said, it, it, there is the reality, but there is the balance, and I think you don't want to draw artificial balances. If somebody feels comfortable to talk to you, Talk to that person. Who cares? It's not the vote you will get because this person might be in a different district, but it's 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 showing that that the overall good of Monterey is 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 at stake here. So so that's just what I wanted to to comment uh, and uh, thank you for for allowing me to speak, Vice Mayor Smith. Um, Hans, I want to uh, go off something I reminded of that is in the spirit of what you just said. Um, and that's uh, Dan Albert Sr. who coined the phrase the Monterey Way and supported that with very similar things that you just addressed, which is the 
the mentality, the attitude, um, the the efforts, but it's Monterey first and Monterey solves problems. And I think that's what a lot of people really love about Monterey is that we get stuff done. And our staff does a wonderful job doing that. And as we are in district elections, I can see that there may be more stuff that comes from districts, but I think overriding that at the bottom of our core belief, it's that Monterey Way should be alive and well because there's a, a right way to do things and you can, you can never try and find a, a right way to do a wrong thing. And I think the, the wrong thing to do here would be to start a different culture that uh, disrespects uh, a citizen's comment or concern just because it doesn't come from my district. And I think those are the things that should drive any council member representing uh, their, their council districts is that we're responsible to fix things and we have to think citywide and certainly get stuff done at the district level as well. Uh, but I, I think I just, just remember that so aptly who was a corner of mine when I was working at the city. Uh, Dan, I see your hand. Actually, I think Alan was first. Go ahead, Alan. Alan, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Go ahead. No worries, thanks guys. Um, I was just gonna, just gonna add that um, it, in fact, it can be really hard sometimes to identify what is neighborhood specific versus what is citywide. So even if, let's say you're talking about a project and yeah, it's located in a particular neighborhood and district, obviously it has district specific impacts, but most of the time it also has citywide impacts. Housing's a great example of that, right? Yes, a housing project is going to have neighborhood specific impacts, but it also has citywide impacts. And honestly, that's true of almost everything we we do. Uh, I, I think I'd be hard pressed to kind of think of something that really is truly only relevant to one specific district. So I guess the long and short of that is I'm maybe kind of circling back and saying, in a way, I kind of agree with what the city manager said, but Again, our new future districtly elected council members may see it differently. And, and there is just that potential for, for, uh, for rough waters if we're not at least aware of that. Okay, uh, Ed, I'll make a final comment then I'm sure that uh, now we'll probably want to move on. Um, I think the thing that, that I'm fearful the most is this, this council is really good at, I think, at as one voice. We seem to all speak for the city in one voice. And what I'm fearful for is that if we do go to districting, it will no longer be one voice. Um, meaning that if we all have priorities and we've agreed to those priorities, if someone in your district doesn't agree with those priorities, will you stick to the discipline of that is our voice uh, of the city of Monterey? We all agreed upon this and uh, we're moving towards that goal. Um, so that's that's one of my fears is that uh, we no longer are speaking as one voice and that's the city of Monterey. Yeah, we don't wanna be silent. No. Okay, um, good to go to, we still have a couple more questions. We can skip some of these, but uh, one of the questions is when we talk about delivering services with, as uh, one of our council members has mentioned, limited resources, which we of course have uh, in any city, including Monterey, is uh, what factors and principles have made Monterey successful in the first place? And I think we, we talked about that, uh, but if anyone has anything they'd like to share in particular, please feel free to do so. Uh, I see uh, Alan and, and Dan, you have your... Uh, I would just I, that this is oh go ahead Alan I was just going to say that um you know I really wonder if this isn't an opportunity in future budgeting to kind of look at how we budget and do we where do our resources go now that may be hard to do I'm guessing it would be some things like for example our biggest two spender or two biggest sort of probably Expenses are public safety, I would guess, 
you know, police and fire together. And, you know, really they serve the whole city. So I, I don't know, but, you know, when you're talking about discretionary spending, you know, and probably most of that is NCIP. So I don't know. It's a question, I guess. Maybe the staff would have some insight on this. I do think that this is an opportunity for us to make sure and kind of double check that while we are speaking with one voice and we're looking at the whole city, are we being equitable in the distribution of our resources? I think we are, but I don't know for a fact, I guess. Sounds like a, a future project for the Navy Postgraduate School but to look at the results of this thing in our budget. Um, Dan, I see you're here. Um, so what has made us successful is that um, for me, our, our revenue generating uh, partner, which is hospitality and uh, and our small businesses. I mean, that's what's made us really successful because we're able to take the, that funding and move it to services that no other city has. Um, I mean, look at our recreation department. I mean, no cities have the recreation department that we have. No cities have the parks that we have and the park staff to keep those staffs up. So those are some of the factors that I think really make this city unique is that we have the money to do what we need to do to, to, uh, to, to let the neighbors know that you're in a great city to live in. So uh, I think that's a big one on the list. Yeah. And I think the temptation may be in some future council that they say, well, last budget, uh, I, my district park got left out and, and it could be we're talking about $50,000 and one park got left out and this district got it. And so quibbling could occur, but I would hope that the equalizer here is the mayor and the city manager that they're able to really participate in solving some of those uh, minor disputes. But I think that if we stay focused on uh, projects that, that come out of a long process with a lot of partners. The toughest one is when we get down to the discretionary dollars in, in a budget. And sometimes, as you know, we see there's not a lot of discretionary dollars in the budget. That, that also comes down to managing, let's just say parks, for instance, because yeah. that's a good example, because we have parks in all of our districts. Yeah. Um, it, it comes down to managing those parks and making sure that it's equitable uh, whatever the maintenance is of those of those parks, not to put pressure on the staff, but uh, making sure that one park is not given more than another park, or one school is not given more than the other school. Right. So it, it has a lot to do with managing um, those those different areas of the district. Yeah. Uh, Nat, I think we're ready for. Let's go to the next one. Yep, uh, I think we, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, Council Member Hoff, I believe, mentioned the reality is, uh, the question is, from a constituent expectation standpoint, what might residents expect in the new way of electing council members? Obviously, uh, they may turn to their district, uh, the, the person they may have elected uh, first, and, and that's understood. Uh, but anything else to add on that one? I know we have a couple more questions. Uh, I, I think from a first blush, I think the Question's a fair question, and I don't have a specific answer. I have an inclination to think that it's going to take a while. I think that uh, there's an education process that's going on right now. Um, I think with time, that may get more solidified among our community, our neighbors. But I think part of the opportunity for the city council members and the mayor in the education process is to share our understanding of how we work together as a board and and wipe out the parochial division that may occur from from a, um, a resonance perspective because many other communities are very solidified in terms of hard and fast borders and the way they operate and the way they have their budgets especially if you get a new resident that comes in so i think this with time and education i think that this will improve the community's expectations and understanding of how a district uh, districting operates. Just my inclination, I think it will take a little bit of time. 
Uh, Dan, your hand is up. Is that from the last? Yeah, I'm. I'm just trying to think if if this is what I want to say or not. I, I think it's very simple for me if I was a, a district uh, council member and someone came to me for a project that I didn't think was good for the city of Monterey, I would just say that. I would tell them that, you know, it's a good idea. I like the idea, but I'm not quite sure if it's good for all of the city of Monterey. And, and that's that's a tough thing to tell one of your, your own uh, district uh, residents. But again, you have to be disciplined to do it if that's what everybody wants. Yeah. Um, Alan, I see your hand. Yeah, here I, I maybe have a little bit of a different point of view than the staff report. Um, so for example, I think the staff report said that council members in their districts shouldn't expect to be able to use city resources to, for example, have, I guess, district related community meetings. But I think, in fact, that's what residents may expect when there's a project coming into a district that's controversial. I think residents are going to expect perhaps a neighborhood or district meeting. And I think they're probably going to look to their districted council member to be a leader in putting that together. And I don't think that's completely inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's if it's about you know, if it's about self-promotion or campaigning, I think that's very different, but I, I don't think it's inappropriate. I think it is appropriate for council members to be able to make use of city resources and staff resources in a reasonable way. It doesn't mean you're doing it all the time, but where there is a genuine controversial issue or project, I think it is appropriate that that council member be given support to facilitate communication between the city staff and the residents in that district. I don't know if I said that well, but I, I, that, that's what I believe. Um, I, Alan, I can agree with that as long as the projects that, um, that, that the council member is advocating for, the whole council knows about it. It's not done uh, behind closed doors with the city manager and the city manager budgeting the money for the project. And all of a sudden I find out or somebody finds out that that project was completed without the council knowing. I mean, little small projects, yeah, but big projects, I think that has to be approved by the, the council. Um, so Alan, uh, I appreciate your perspective there. I'm not sure if the staff report is necessarily um, excluded from what you're opinion is there. I, the way I read that was um, when a council member, let's say a future council member, uh, is elected to a particular district, and then they expect that the city manager and staff is conducting meetings um, to the benefit of them. So in a in the term that's used is, or, or similar activities for self-promotion only in a council member's elected this district. So I sort of read that a little different. I hear you, but I guess uh, maybe that's uh, for a conversation with the city manager if we have those conflicts, but I would not want to see one district that leverages our city staff to benefit them or only benefit the district. But I would look to, you know, how does it have crossover to all the other districts? And maybe that meeting should be opened up to everybody at the city council and, uh, uh, chambers or uh, community forum that is inviting everybody from the district. Uh, I would imagine a district elected council member would find a way to host their own meeting to address, um, I would call it a niche topic for just that district where they, uh, and they talk to a, a closed circle of folks. Um, it probably would not require city staff time. And uh, so Vice Mayor Smith, it would be okay to move to the next question. If uh, the last and final. I don't see any other. Uh, if I could just add to the last one. Yes, Tyler, go ahead. So um, I think the question being, um, you know, what the expectation of our residents are. Um, I think it's that open dialogue and communication around this transition to district based elections, which I think the staff has done a really great job. At, at creating that process and using have your say Monterey. I can guarantee though that there's still some residents that will likely get their ballot 
um, in in October in the mail and be surprised to see that they can't vote for two council members. So where are those additional opportunities to kind of keep that open communication and dialogue? I'm not sure if there is, I'm just, just putting that out there to just kind of answer that question. And, and to share with all of you, we uh, the Monterey County Elections Office, they will have a one page uh, sheet identifying and talking about what district-based elections is so that uh, it helps inform voters as part of that voter guide. Absolutely. Yeah. And then last question, you know, how can the council continue to work as a cohesive team through the transition? So uh, any thoughts on teamwork? Any, um, any thoughts? Come on, team. <laughs> Well, yeah, any, any thoughts? Come on, team. I think it's just about being collegial, right? Which I don't think is um, gets away from anything in how the council has been managing over this last these last four years, at least since I've been on the council. I think for the most part, we've been able to kind of maintain that that culture, and and I think it's just continuing to show in the transition that um, despite the fa the fact that some of us live in different districts. We don't have to become territorial and we can, can kind of maintain that focus on um, citywide goals and, and outcomes. Um, yeah, so I just have a comment about the choice of governance that the city has always has had, which is a, a strong city manager form government with um, a mayor citywide and now districts. And the mayor and all the council members have the same vote. So the equilibrium there is that, yes, the mayor runs the meetings and certainly has a, a voice. But at the end of the day, after we go through all of the protocols and we invite the public to speak, and we've all had our opportunities to opine on an agenda item, the call for the vote, everybody gets the one vote. So I, I think the system works. I don't think we have to try really hard to uh, try and invent protocols and countermand. I think part of this is um, very basic human respect, and dignity of others' opinions, and allowing other people to voice their opinions. And at the end of the day, after the discussion's all over, then we take the vote. And then when the vote's done, we're still on the council together and we still get along and we still respect each other. So I think that, that the system works. Um, and I think it, it, it lends itself to really drill down into what's a cohesive team. A cohesive team is one that is um, very tolerant of each other and uh, can deviate from time to time because we have mutual respect for, for each other. And we can also, we're also, all allowed to be a little bit creative. And then our city manager and staff can kind of reel it in to kind of conceptualize an idea. Uh, so I, I think with a strong uh, city manager and the mayor form of government where we all have one vote, I, I just think it's a, a good system. It works for a city of 30,000. Um, any other thoughts on this last question concerning teamwork? That's uh, Hoffa has the same one. Go ahead. Yeah, I do think that, um, especially as new new council members come on board, it's going to be important for the city manager to come up with sort of team building opportunities, I think. Another thing we may want to consider, and I'm just, again, putting it out there, I don't know if, if this is something we should do, but, you know, um, MPUSD, the board developed a a kind of guideline for board interaction and, and kind of ethical behavior. Now, admittedly, it came up in an environment where there was a lot of unethical behavior <laughs> and a lot of bad blood. And, and in some ways, it's a lot harder to develop a kind of, you know, protocol like that when people are already really upset with each other and don't trust each other. Um, so maybe we, we maybe we want to at least start that uh, thinking about that before the change happens. Of course, again, three council members in the future could decide they don't like what we come up with or they want to change it. And that's fine. That's their right. 
But, you know, we have, you know, what we call the Monterey Way, and we've talked about it, and it's really a culture, but sometimes it can help to codify culture in a, in a way so that it's crystal clear for people who may not be as familiar with it. So that's just a thought. We may want to look at that. It's a tricky thing again, because five of us may not all agree on everything on that. And that's okay. But you kind of come to the center of what you can agree on as sort of basic ethical and collegial behavior as expectations. Alan, all of a sudden you, you brought up some really horrible memories. <laughs> to be honest with you. But you know, um, I think I agree with the, the fact that those... Um, the way you run meetings and the way you act in meetings should should uh, be put together before it actually happens. Because once the horses are out of the corral, it's very difficult to get them back on track. So I, I agree that that's maybe something that the new council should do and not us, um, because uh, they would have different ideas and, and, um, and values, but I know one value that I think everybody can agree on that will be on that is, is respect. That's probably the, the big key. Yeah, respect and concern. Um, I think if, if it's okay with you, council members uh, and, and uh, Vice Mayor Smith, we've got a few more slides just, and this is a perfect segue as mm -hmm. we look at codifying and what that might look like for next steps. Is that, is that okay with everyone? Yes. Great. Uh, what we like to, to do now is, uh, talk a little bit about the mutually monterey framework and this uh, the idea of codifying what um, if, if council agrees to to this framework and what this could look like uh, the idea behind this concept what we what we call it mutually monterey is because we are talking about and have been discussing mutual respect uh, talking about uh, what it means to be mutually collaborative and looking for mutually beneficial solutions to the community's challenges and supporting diversity, equity, and inclusiveness by working together. And what we've done is put together uh, this, uh, this document. These are what we call proposed principles. You probably can't read them, so I'll zoom in uh, to the actual PDF document if you all can uh, hopefully, hopefully see this once I zoom in a little bit more. But um, the idea behind this is these are principles for the council to uh, consider as we look at having this uh, one Monterey or mutually Monterey concept. The first one is to reaffirm that the council is committed to working mutually and collaboratively under the council manager form of govern government and governing as a body that respects the interests of the city as a whole. The second is to recognize that a council member election district is not a political subdivision and that the mayor and council members take an oath to represent the entire city of Monterey and its residents and that the mayor and council members are committed to making decisions that are in the interest of the entire community, hearing residents from across the city and giving equal consideration to issues and people inside and outside council member election districts. Also understanding that uh, democracy means that members of the council may not always agree on issues, but are committed to respecting one another, respecting members of the community and engaging in a healthy debate as we've discussed and this stuff been brought up tonight. Respecting that one decision is made, once a decision is made by council, all members of the council and staff will work to support that decision, regardless of whether or not one initially supported that decision, because we're all committed to a positive outcome for the city. Also uh, committing to ensure, uh, or committing to continue to fully engage regarding every issue, regardless of which districts may be most directly impacted by that issue. This includes hearing all stakeholders without regard to which district they might reside. Agreeing that decisions regarding resources of the city government, both financial and personnel, will continue to be based on the needs of all residents in the city, not simply divided by districts. City resources will not be used to conduct meetings or similar activities for self-promotion, only in a council member's election district, as that would not, not unite our community. We talked about that briefly today. And then continuing to raise issues and concerns using the established process with the city manager or the process to request for an item to be added to a city council agenda. Council members will continue to work through the city manager or city attorney rather than consult other staff. And then last but not least, representing all neighborhoods in Monterey and continuing to work mutually as a city council to represent the greater good. 
so what we've done is uh, drafted this and put it into a one page document with uh, with these proposed principles that uh, Council may choose to consider uh, whether that's uh, looking at that today or perhaps um, perhaps in the future. And in, in summary, what Mutually Monterey is, is reinforcing the idea that council members are elected by residents in their district, but represent all residents in the city. And, and we underline this and uh, italicize it uh, because we feel this summarizes the Mutually Monterey uh, best and perhaps, and hopefully what we've discussed. So what are some of the options for next steps for council to consider as we uh, close out uh, the afternoon or the evening here. Some of the recommended practices that we've seen from other communities uh, conducting, and, and again, discussed this earlier, is just, uh, conducting workshops on annual priorities. We do that as a council, uh, informing the public about the city's governance structure, protocols, and practices. We talked today about developing policymakers through onboarding for new council members to serve the city as a whole providing candidate training and orientation. Uh, Council Member Williamson mentioned this earlier as well. And then communicating clearly about the council manager form of government and the fact that staff direction is provided through the city manager's office and decisions are made by the policymakers, all of you, the city council members. So our staff recommendation in a nutshell today is one is uh, perhaps to continue the discussion about unified governance at a future study session or maybe a city council workshop. Uh, council may also choose if you like to proceed to bring forward the core concepts from the mutually Monterey framework as presented or or if you like to modify it in uh, for adoption in the form of resolution. Uh, some cities have taken uh, this type of framework and have adopted that as uh, something uh, for the council to consider and for future councils to also consider. And uh, this is uh, wraps up the staff presentation this afternoon. Thank you, Nat. Uh, let me turn to my fellow counselors and, and get their, uh, their thoughts on uh, this last portion of the presentation and the uh, code of conduct. If we could put that back up for us on the slide, I appreciate that. Uh, the Mutually Monterey document you shared with us. Um, council comments on this portion of the presentation. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I think it's a good idea, but I think this particular proposal needs some work, at least for me. I, I couldn't support it as it is. There's just a few things that stand out that I would want to have more conversation about. I guess one is the statement that the election districts is not a political subdivision. Practically speaking, it is. I mean, the reality is they are different political subdivisions of the city. I can't vote in District 2. Ed can't vote in District 4. So, I mean, I mean so I, I, I don't know. I, I get the intent, but I, I, I'm not sure that that is even really factually true, I guess, depending on how you define what a political subdivision means. Yeah. I like the idea of, you know, um, the oath being about representing the, the entire city. Uh, I think that's true, and I think that's important. But um, I also think that somehow, in maybe in the next sentence, that they're committed to making decisions that are in the interests of their community as well as the entire community, something like that. Because people in districts are going to expect a council person to represent the particular interests of that district. And that's that's just as real as the desires of Mutual Monterey to make sure we don't become parochial. Another thing that kind of stood out was um, the about working to support a decision. Um, I, I think that's, again, kind of a tricky thing. What does that mean exactly? Does that mean that after a vote, a council person who was in the minority of that vote can never publicly say anything um, contrary about that decision. It just seems problematic in terms of First Amendment rights on one level, but also practically speaking, I get the intent, the intent, and I think that can be massaged, something like once a decision is made by the city council, 
you know, um, all members of the city council um, accept the decision. There's a difference between accepting that that was the will of the majority and actively working to support a decision I may not agree with. I can think of some, and I bet all of us can. So, and then the last thing had to do with the language around city resources and meetings. I do agree that it shouldn't be for self-promotion, but I, I, I would still like to, uh, to yeah. see some, I think I, what I said before, that there may be a need at times and it may be appropriate, maybe with, I don't know, I don't know, but that, that I think needs a little bit of, of work. Yeah, and, and yes. if I may just clarify, this is just uh, the the concept of okay, here's how we can uh, put all the consensus of the council at a later point of time in some sort of um, uh, a tenant uh, that that represents those principles. Uh, and I just wanted to, um, yes, absolutely, Council Mahaffa, as we call it, a draft. But that would be something again that that would be. Um, a good way of, of presenting it also in the chamber, presenting it at numerous occasions and kind of reaffirming this, um, uh, the mutually agreed upon tenants about uh, proposed principles uh, working on a district-based election uh, form of governance. So, so uh, thank you for, for all the input. You, you saw a great deal of that was reflective of some of the points you raised. Uh, all of you raised, but you saw also that uh, there's still quite a lot of work to be done to find something that um, all five of you can agree upon. So thank you for that input. Yeah, thank, thank you, Hans. Um, I want to reflect on the comments. What I don't want to do tonight is to try and craft this tonight and start. Yeah. This. I think this is a good start. Um, and I appreciate a, proce a process is uh, very important in this as we collectively because words have meaning, and so we've offered some answers to some of those uh, posed questions. I think we should approach this as a draft, as Hans has looked at. I think, number one, we should make a comment in terms of does mutually Monterey proposed principles resonate with us, and do we see some things that we would want to offer to clarify, enhance, pop out and, and individually and if we chose different words, would it express something that we all agree with? So I think that there's an opportunity to move this ahead. Uh, Dan. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, and just going back to uh, self-promotion in the in the document. Well, first of all, um, I, I appreciate the staff uh, being proactive. This is a proactive document, not a reactive document because if, if in the future uh, we do have issues or challenges when it comes to uh, all being on the same page, and again, then we have to craft this document, it, it's kind of a negative way of looking at it because we're reacting to something that's been negative to begin with. So to be proactive, I think that's great. I, I, but there are some areas of that, just like Alan, that I haven't really uh, paid a whole lot of attention to. I mean, I haven't read it uh, with, with um, with a with different different eyes but the one thing that i did did understand was that self-promotion to me could be very subjective i don't think anybody will admit that they're being self-promoted but so I, i'm not quite sure about that that comment because um and i'm not sure if that should be in there uh, i think that's just ethics um, you, you, and, and i don't know uh, to me I'm, I'm not quite sure about that one um, but again um, this document is a is a policy document, and I'm not sure because I think there will be three new council members coming up in November, or at least two, uh, depending on who is running. Um, so I, I think we can we can craft it out, we can talk about it, but I think the new council is really going to be the ones that'll codify it. Uh, Ed, if I can go ahead. Yes, Tyler, go ahead. So the fourth, um, I think it's the fourth paragraph it identifies that all members of the city council and staff will work to support a decision um well I, I, let me just read it in full so it's clear so it says respecting that once a decision is made by the council all members of the city council and staff will work to support that decision regardless of whether or not one initially supported that decision i'm not sure if 
you know, affirming that you necessarily support a decision just because the decision has been made by the majority of the council. Um, I'm not sure if that's the appropriate way of phrasing that. It could just be taking off respect that at the beginning and saying, once a decision is made by the council, all members of the city council and staff will work just to respect that decision. I mean, I think that might, uh, just wordsmithing that a little bit. I don't know exactly what that looks like. So I, I just wanted to throw that out. Um, and then the next one, committing to continue to fully engage. I think that needs just some wordsmithing. It might just be better to say, committing to be engaged. And I'm not sure if even saying fully engaged is necessary because you know, there might be issues that, yeah, I'll be engaged on if I'm in a district seat, but maybe I don't need to be as engaged as the district representative for that district. So um, maybe just saying commit, committing to be full, to be engaged regarding every issue before the council, regardless of which district, so on and so forth. So maybe just some wordsmithing to that one too. Tyler, thank you. Um, Hans, what, what is your preference in terms of uh, moving forward? Um, and I don't want to cut off anybody else if they have a comment, but uh, we are up against the time. Um, staff recommendations. And I'll, I'll speak for Hans. He's, he had to make a quick, uh, a quick run. Um, okay. I, our recommendation is to uh, seek guidance. Would we like to come back? One of the best practices is to have uh, a framework, if you will, that might even be adopted for a council before a transition. I know there was some discussion about do we want to have this adopted after. We could at least check in with the uh, based on the feedback we received on mutually Monterey and the pros, pros concepts, maybe come back, whether that's in uh, August or September at a future study session with uh, recommended updated language uh, based on the feedback tonight. And we could discuss further if, if council wants. If council would prefer to, to just say, let's hold off uh, until the new year, we, we can do that as well. It's a pleasure of the council. Uh, I think I think it would make sense for staff to maybe take some of the input they heard from council tonight and uh, and maybe use that to to modify some of what you had tonight and then bring it back for another study session where we would do a lot more listening to the public. You know, the staff would present kind of, you know, what what you come up with at that time. And then because I think we also do need to hear a lot more from the public before we kind of formalize this. So I would think that might make sense. Thank you, Alan. Uh, others comments? I think just speaking to Alan's point, I know today wasn't maybe necessarily as focused on the public, but are we doing public comment on this? We still need to take public comment. Yes, that's correct. Um, okay, so other comments on this before we, we go to public comment. Okay, seeing none, seeing none, Nat, this is probably a good time to uh, go and receive public comments. We do have uh, one public commenter and uh, Esther Malkin, uh, please feel free to. Speak. Good afternoon, everybody. I just. Um... I'm interested in, in how this is going to actually work rather than all this theory, because a lot of this is sounding good, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's actually going to happen. Um, and again, just a reminder that we have a majority of the residents in the city are renters, and it's not a small majority, 66%. And this system doesn't really help getting them represented um, because unfortunately the people that have the money and the time to run a campaign and get elected are the ones that represent on the council so i don't know how much real equity we're going to get out of this it, and again it all sounds good in theory but you know the community of interest of renters that are the majority of the residents in the city were not even considered until I mentioned it when you guys started talking about the districts. So I'm hoping that everybody continues to remember that because it is not just in our city, in most cities, the people that turn out are business owners and homeowners when it comes to county and city meetings. 
and it's not the renters. So their, their voices are rarely heard and their numbers are always less. So it's going to be, you know, if you want this all to sound as inclusive and equi equitable as it's supposed to be, we need to keep that majority of residents in mind first and foremost better than we have before because we have not been able to do anything really in winter policies because of that. So hopefully that will maybe change. And I, I hope that this, in theory, it, it does work out. So let, I guess that remains to be seen. But that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Um, Nat, any, uh, any callers? Yes, we, we do have a, a few more, and um, we'll let uh, Kent Glenzer uh, say a few words as well. Welcome, Kent. We ask uh, Kent if you could unmute. All right, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for all this. It's been it's been really great, you know, as a citizen to to be part of this. I'm just going to make one broad comment, and I don't want anybody to take this personally um, on either the city staff or on the, on the council. But I will tell you, but listening to the last couple of hours of this conversation, mostly what I've been hearing is fear. Most I've been hearing from council members and also from city proposals is we're really worried about these new voices and we've got to figure out some way to control them so they don't disrupt what we've been doing before. Now, nobody in this call meant to do that, but I'm telling you, listening to it, that's what it sounded like about 80%. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Kent. And we're going to hear next from Jean Rash. Welcome, Jean. Thank you. I didn't realize you were going to take public comment, so I'm not really prepared, but I think I um, owe you my honest reaction. Um, I think the council thinks things are going better than I think they're going or residents think they're going. Um, I don't see you agreeing on, on most things and I don't see you agreeing on serious things. And I, I'm not saying that's a problem, but you're kind of portraying that you all get along and that, um, that um, you all see eye to eye. Uh, and that's what I'm hearing today and, and you don't. Um, I also want to share that when I hear the Monterey way, and I've seen it applied, to me it feels very coercive, as if you want everybody to come to the middle and be good Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and behave. That's the way I feel it applied often. And I think we're coming to a time when we need more strong voices or I don't want to say extreme because I, I don't want to portray myself as an extremist or many people, but the answers are, need, we need stronger answers. We need more housing. We need a stronger hold on what we're going to do about the homeless. We need, we need answers. We, we, we can't stay in the middle. We've got to have climate control. We've got to, we have to have more serious constraints on carbon emissions and all the power tools and the garden tools. And we can't stay in the middle. So that's what I hope for the city is that we have stronger, urgent voices that really move us into the 21st century. I don't really think that I heard that today with all respect to all of you, whom all of you I like, and I honor your service. I'm just kind of telling you the, my truth today. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. 
Our next uh, caller is Robert Brunson. Hi, Robert. Good afternoon. I uh, mind just a quick comment and it relates to the section about the principles on the use of resources. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that I'm clear on what the intent of that was, but it, it sounded like it could be used to say that the city resources really aren't available if you have a sort of a single district project or a single district um, subject, and that unless a, unless a project can be demonstrated to have citywide impact, then don't think you're gonna be meeting at a rec center or don't think you're gonna be meeting at city hall because that's too district focused and could potentially even be seen as self-promoting because we happen to have council members who represent those districts. So I think, I think you wanna be really careful about carving it up so narrowly that suddenly city resources aren't available for city business just because of you know sort of an artificial boundary uh, application that, that really limits what we do as a, as a city. So that was my, my main comment. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Robert. All right, that uh, concludes public comment online. And uh, Clementine, is there anyone in the council chambers? We have no public commenters in the chamber right now. Okay, back to Vice Mayor Smith. Oh, uh, you're muted, Ed, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I want to turn to uh, and see if you have any uh, closing comments and if you could include uh, your preference uh, for moving. What would it look like to you? Okay, we got any uh, first uh, comment? All right, well, I guess I'll go ahead and kind of repeat what I said before. I, I think that this is worth doing. I do think the comments from the public were were well put and on point actually. I mean, there's just sort of a natural tendency for an organization and the leaders, those of us who are here on council and and um, and in upper management to, to be comfortable with the way we've done things and to kind of wanna make sure doesn't change too much. But the reality is that with new voices, there's going to be new ideas and perhaps even a desire to do things differently. And we're gonna to have to, the city's gonna to have to adjust to that. Um, on the other hand, if we can really capture what it is that, um, that the whole community really um, believes is sort of the way we should do things as a city and, and, and captures our sort of universal values as a city. I think that totally makes sense to, to adopt and reinforce. Um, so I, I won't get into my, the specifics, but I think maybe staff should take kind of the feedback from council and, and the public come back with something and we have another another um another forum like this and maybe we also even try to get the public commenting a little bit more on the front end but i do think we want to do something i do think we should adopt something and i think it should happen before the new council of course the new council can change it but i uh but but i think it's good to have something in place thank you Alan. Others? I, I appreciate I appreciated hearing the uh, the public input, and I think that it is important for us to make sure that we're including language of our embrace of us embracing the the transfer to district based elections. I think we have to be careful um, not to make it appear as if we're we're being resistant to or that we're in fear of. So I think that that was really good uh, public input because again, this is. I, I personally feel like this is going to allow the city to make better decisions from a more diverse perspective. And, and I think that has to be embraced. Thanks, Tyler. Okay, uh, just a couple of thoughts. Uh, appreciate the callers. Um, and I think I would say that doing what we started tonight uh, may look clunky and because it's difficult. A lot of the elements of what we were talking about is uh, philosophy and personal belief system and approaches and preferences. 
and everyone has their own and everyone has their own style. And I think uh, this is a start of a collaborative effort. Uh, I think what we saw tonight was a, a great initiative by the city staff. And thank you very much. As Dan has indicated, uh, I think it is proactive. And I, what I'm hearing from everybody else is that they're, they're willing to work through this uh, to get the language right where it feels right, where it's a, a true and accurate statement. Uh, and certainly we want the public to be able to participate in this as they are our bosses. They're the ones that uh, speak, they're the ones that elect us, and they are the ones that have the strongest opinion. So I think if we can work together uh, and schedule this in a, in a future meeting to make sure that we have uh, more comments from our public and uh, get into the mode where we're, we're drafting and getting to agreements uh, in, in content, I think we'll, we'll wind up with a document that will give us some a guiding future. One thing I would say that um, I've heard this before in some of the training through uh, California League of Cities and uh, much of the transitions that take place with council members um, going into elections, I think it's much easier for us to, to be able to have this document uh, prepared for those that join the council. Uh, but as th those that join the council, they certainly have an opportunity to add to this and redirect. And I think this is a document that's ongoing that will be approached more than just this one time and then just hung on a wall and that's forever and ever uh, as a constitution. I think that this will be the kind of document that uh, would morph into the statement of content and tenets that represent every council as they move forward. Um, city manager, any other comments? Have we accomplished everything that we were tasked to do tonight? Thank you so much. No, this was uh, very helpful. And uh, I want to just echo what, what you all said. The feedback from the public was very helpful and informative and will guide us as well. So we will come back with that uh, as, as I think that's kind of the consensus here of the group. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hit all the right notes and um, you might um, uh, get more input and then we'll hopefully launch it prior to the elections as well. Thank you for that. Great. Well, you mentioned notes, but I'm not sure everybody would agree in the kind of music they like. So that is the challenge in our document. We'll yeah. But I think this council can get there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this meeting is adjourned.